Hi, my name's Guy Adams, and I'm the Chief Technology Officer at Datrops.live. In this session, I'm going to show you how to use our Datrops platform to achieve full Snowflake automation in a single click. So before we get into that, let's go and do that single click. Let's kick off with this from a demo perspective. So inside my uh, demo Snowflake environment, you can see I've got um, environments for production, for dev, for some feature branches. We'll come back and explain these. But one thing I'm missing is a QA environment. So I'm going to go and create that QA environment now, and I'm going to do it with a single click. So when we want to create any environment, whether it's creating from scratch, whether it's updating because I've made some functional changes, whether it's just updating because there's some new data to be ingested, all I do is select which branch I want to run it for, which is essentially which environment and which pipeline type I want to run. So in this case, I'm running the full pipeline for QA, and that's it. Run pipeline, there's, there's my single click. So at this point, I'm a passenger. That environment is going to be built completely automatically, including ingesting data, testing, transforming, publishing, updating data catalogs, everything with a single click. So while that's running in the background, let's go back and look a little bit more about what's going to happen. So we are focused here on talking about how we build developer value. And if we think about our mission to automate the build, test, and deploy of data applications and data products on the Snowflake Data Cloud, we can really put that value into three buckets. The first one is all about agility. How do we deploy completely new products or new applications and maybe, um, maybe a complete new software application? It may simply be a new analytical output. But how do we deploy completely new things in days, not months? And once it's deployed, how do we take requirements from the business and turn around changes into production, having gone through a very carefully controlled, governed and managed change process, but still turn those around in hours, not weeks? As part of that, how do we automate the build of everything inside Snowflake declarative, which is what I'm going to show today. We also need some extensibility. So we have an extensible container based architecture so that we can orchestrate absolutely anything inside the data ecosystem or even outside. And finally, to get a really good developer experience and to enable full developer agility, we have to fit in with what people are used to in terms of tools, in terms of processes. So we have a completely standard Git based development flow. The second bucket that's important to developers is trust and observability. Trust because they need to trust and their users need to trust the data and observability because ultimately this is a relatively complicated ecosystem when we look at all the different tools that people have and pe you know, people want to get a complete end-to-end -end observability for it. Automated testing is key for trust. And you'll see that when we go through the pipeline, testing at multiple different stages to make sure that what we think should be happening with the data is actually what's happening with the data. On the back of that, only publishing data to my business users when I know that data is good. You know, gone are the days when we can treat our users as our testers. Our, te our users do not expect to see anything that we haven't tested ourselves. And if we're ingesting data every 30 minutes or every 15 minutes, the only way we can do that testing meaningfully is automatically. As I said, visibility of what can be a fairly heterogeneous and complex environment in many customers by seeing all of the logs, all of the monitoring, all the relationships between the process in the single end-to-end -end view. And it doesn't matter how good our automated testing is, at some point, something will slip into production that we didn't want. So automated testing helps us prevent bad things getting into production, but the reality is eventually something will. So the ability to roll back, not just our configuration and our code, but also our data using time travel inside Snowflake to a known good point in time is absolutely critical. And it makes developers a lot more comfortable knowing that if something bad does happen, they've got a tried and tested rollback method. And finally, data sharing is becoming an increasingly important part of how people uh, share data within and outside their organizations. And there's some significant challenges in being able to test that what I think I've put through a data share is actually what is being uh, what is visible externally, what is visible on the other side of the share. So robust data sharing automation is a key part of that trust and observability. And that kind of brings us on to the, to the third bucket, which is security and governance. So we have a hybrid cloud model. The, the application that I'm using is, is our SaaS application where we do all of our um, development and control and orchestration. But the actual execution of this work is happening on agents inside the customer's network, inside their on-prem data centers, inside their private clouds. So we have, a, we have that mix of, of hybrid cloud where you want it and on-prem where you need it. We integrate with all of the enterprise secrets managers. So AWS secrets manager, Azure, Key Vault, HashiCorp Vault, all those sort of tools. Um, and then we're able to pass those tokens and those credentials into other data tools. Pretty much everybody wants now to have their credentials managed in some sort of enterprise secrets manager, but most of the tools in the data ecosystem don't support that. 
So we provide that bridge. We take the, the credentials out the secret manager and we feed them into those tools at runtime. So you don't have to secret manager enable every single tool in the ecosystem. From an auditing perspective, it's not just who changed what, when, where, why, but also what automated test results were run, what were the pipeline results for that, who peer reviewed it. So we have essentially a, a complete and a near perfect set of auditability for everything in the system. From a governance perspective, and this you could argue this belongs in agility and it, it lives in both places, but from a governance perspective, it's very hard to get good governance if you've just got lots of copy and paste reuse everywhere. So promoting and providing tools that allow configuration and code reuse, allow templating, um, allow inheritance, means that you can have one non-repetitive way of doing things. It's much easier to then guarantee that my whole organization is doing things the right way. And if I do need to make a change or fix or improve something, I make it one place, it rolls out everywhere. Finally, from a security perspective, it actually turns out to be very hard when you get a complex infrastructure to manage your grants correctly. And part of the reason for that is because grants are typically managed away from the actual things that you're managing the grants on the functional logic. So we, as a, as a matter of principle, define all our grants alongside the functional logic, and I'll, I'll show that in a minute. So when we're looking at building everything automatically, there's a, this is a representative of a typical pipeline. Obviously, they, they vary from customer to customer. Um, there are multiple phases in this. Um, the initialization, which is where typically the secrets manager integration happens, a bunch of testing and validation. The structure, which is where we're building the entire Snowflake environment or updating it if changes need to be made. The ingestion process where we're orchestrating or doing direct ingestion of you know, large amounts of data, full, da full data loads, CDC data loads. And we're testing that data to make sure that the data we just loaded is valid and meaningful. Then we're transforming that data and testing this, that transformation. And ultimately, there may be multiple rounds of, of transformation and testing. Ultimately, if all of that is successful and passes, we're publishing this data to our users. So up to this point, we've been creating data that we think is good enough for our users, but only after we've done that final set of testing can we confirm that, we publish it to our users. And then we go and do a set of sort of metadata actions. So these might be um, updating data catalogs. It might be generating uh, tools to explore how the users and roles work inside Snowflake, things like that. For the purposes of this discussion today, we're gonna to be focusing mostly on this structure piece, how we build that, build or update that entire Snowflake infrastructure automatically with, with a single click. If we drill down to what that means, and if we expand out on this vision of automating the build, test, deploy of data applications and data products on the Snowflake Data Cloud, what we really mean here is the ability to intelligently, by intelligent, I mean working out just what needs to be done, not doing everything blindly, um, and automatically build environments. Those would include our dev environments, our test environments, QA environments, production environments, and even feature branch environments. And I, as a single engineer, have created a branch in my Git repository just to test one simple feature. It might be as small as fixing a typo or aliasing a column, but I still create a branch for that, and I still want to create a complete environment for that to test it before I then merge that into, say, dev. And we want this to manage all Snowflake infrastructure and the associated grants. So that's everything from functions, tables, file formats, pipes, resource monitors, roles, schemas, stages, uh, warehouses, you name it, every one of those is required to run, or at least some combination of those for each customer is required to run a valid Snowflake infrastructure, valid Snowflake environment. So we have to orchestrate everything there. There's two ways of automating infrastructure creation in, in the database world. The, the old way, and the, the way that's been the, the prevalent way for many years has been what we call the imperative approach. Imperative, because SQL is a naturally imperative language, it's a set of instructions, do this, do that. The problem is those, lang those instructions are typically ones that you can't repeat. And therefore, tools like Schema Change and Flyway and Squish, they all solve these in a variation of the same way, which is to say, I'm going to stop each statement running more than once. I will keep a log. We call this a log-based imperative approach. We keep a log of which statements we've run and which ones we haven't, and we'll only run each statement once. There's a number of challenges with that, but probably the biggest one is it's just fundamentally incompatible with, with the Snowflake vision of the world. Um, all of the, you know, those tools are all predicated on this sort of assumption of a monotonically increasing schema. You know, the, the definition of my database only moves forwards over time. But if we think about the Snowflake world, that's exactly what we're not doing anymore. We have the ability to clone databases, clone them at a point in time, time travel, a whole database, a schema, an individual table back to a previous point in time. So there's no way that I can legitimately say just because I have run a statement before, I don't have to run it again. The counterpoint to that and a much, much more robust way of doing this is the declarative approach, where we simply define what we want the world to look like. 
We don't define how to get there. We define the end state, the goal. And we let the engine take care of how to get us there. So in this case, we define our complete Snowflake infrastructure as a set of YAML files, and we let our Snowflake object lifecycle engine um, determine how to implement those. So let's go and look at what that definition looks like inside, inside our Datatrust platform. So I'm going to open up a new tab here. We'll go and look at some of the files. Obviously, there's lots of parts of the Datatrust platform. I'm only looking at one very specific piece. So inside here, Datrop Snowflake, we have a set of definitions. I can look at, and a good one to start with is warehouses, because they're relatively simple objects. I've got the name, my Datrop Ingestion Warehouse. I've got a set of parameters for that, define how I want the naming to work in different environments. And remember, we said we define our grants alongside our functional objects. So we don't have a separate definition of who gets access to what. When I define an object, any type of object, I define who gets the permissions on it. So I've got a couple of different warehouses in here. I've got some users defined in here. I've got some shares. I've got some roles and role inheritance. I've got some resource monitors defined. And then in here, I've got you know, defining a more complex database structure. So I've got some profiles. These are where I'm, I'm defining a, a permissions profile and using it in lots of places. Remember, this, is, this goes back to the reuse and the don't repeat yourself principles. Inside this database, I've defined like, some schemas, some file formats, some stages, some tables, some views, some masking policies. So pretty much a complete set of the things that you would want inside a Snowflake environment. So that's how we've defined it. We've defined it as a set of YAML files. What happens with that? You know, Snowflake doesn't speak YAML, Snowflake speaks SQL. So we have this engine in the middle, the Snowflake Object Lifecycle Engine, and it does two things. First of all, it looks at what is the current state of the environment that I'm supposed to be operating on inside Snowflake. Now we went to look and it was empty. There was no QA environment at all. So it's gonna say at this point, there's nothing there. Then it's going to look at all of those YAML files and compile them down to give a view of what should Snowflake look like. And then in real time, it's going to build a set of instructions so that at the end of it, Snowflake looks like it should. It looks like my, my definition. In this case, it's going to have to build everything. But it might be in a future case that it just has to update a single role or add a single column to a table or remove a grant or change a, change a single parameter of a file format. It doesn't matter. The, every time this runs, it's looking at what does the target environment actually look like today? this moment, what should it look like? And it will create and execute the steps to make it look like it should. And this makes it completely robust to deal with things like time travel and zero copy clone. And all of that happens in this single job called Snowflake Object Lifecycle Engine. So all of that evaluation of what does it look like, all that compiling of YAML, all of that generating and execution of statements all happens in this single job here. And this job's actually run We've, we've built our Snowflake infrastructure. That happened after a minute or two. We're now going through the pipeline's finished its ingestion. It's now going through some, um, some testing. In fact, it's pretty close. It's doing a final testing before publication. So if we go and look inside here and refresh that now, we will hopefully see our QA environment. And inside there, we will see a whole range of schemas and databases and users. And if we go in here, and for example, we've got a query here that shows um, this one. This query will show you know, a lot more objects inside. Um, Snowflake, so we can see we've got tables and views, um, this resource monitor went past, databases, file formats, masking policies, roles, more schemas, more stages, a lot of tables, because we're ingesting quite a bit of data here. Um, so we can see you know, a lot of things that have been generated. Obviously, this is across all the different environments, but all of those have been built as part of that single pipeline execution. So our pipeline, we're still completing our pipeline. In fact, may have just finished. Let's go and have a look. Um, oops. Uh, okay, it's now doing the publish stage. So everything include up, everything up to including the testing has been successful. So in fact, now I can go and have a look. I should be able to go and look at my testing results. So I can go and see and see all of the different tests. I've, I've run 41 test suites. Um, I've had 100% success rate, 146 seconds to run all those tests. So I'm now confident in going and saying, yes, let me automatically publish that data to my users. And then I'll go on and do my generate automated documentation, update some metadata, uh, populate data catalogs, a really important one. And then I may even go and do some internal quality stuff like, you know, does all my SQL match my linting rules? Is my test coverage good? It's all very well having automated testing, but if your coverage isn't good, then you know, it's not really worth very much. So there's some, some cleanup and some hygiene stuff at the end. But our pipeline did exactly what we wanted it to do. It built an entire Snowflake infrastructure from scratch in a single click. If we go back and review that value, against this mission statement. We've seen, hopefully, how we can deploy new products and new environments in, in days, not months. And we can see how you could define in a YAML file a pretty simple infrastructure about you know, to get started. Um, we'll look in a minute at the changes. Um, we've seen definitely the, the decorative automation of everything inside Snowflake. 
we've seen the robust data sharing. We show how we we haven't showed how we sign things to shares, but we sh we showed showed how those shares are set up. We showed the secrets manager integration. We showed the grants alongside the functional logic. So we've shown just in one simple example, you know, a relatively broad range of the benefits for developers. But that was just building a QA environment. What happens to all my other environments? Well, the answer is every single branch I build in my data project will map to a Snowflake environment. So when I run the pipeline in a master branch, I'll get a product environment. When I run QA as I did, I'll get a QA environment. Same with dev, same with feature branches. So if I go and look inside Snowflake now, um, I can see, for example, I've got a feature branch, Snowpark add timestamp environment. If I go and look at my data ops platform, I should have a similar branch, okay, Snow, Snowpark add timestamp. So what I've got here is an environment that is e almost exactly the same as um, my production environment, except that I've made a couple of changes. If I want to find out what those changes are, I'll go and do a comparison here between that branch and my master branch. And I can see, actually, I've added a stored timestamp column. And I've modified, so in this case, we're not just orchestrating the, the, the SQL infrastructure, we're also orchestrating Snowpark functions and Scala code. So I've added another column called current timestamp to my Scala model, and I've written that out to my new table. So this is showing how we've got not just our definitions of the structure inside Snowflake, but also our application definitions all inside a single repository. So we can make our changes together, test them together, deploy them together, promote them together, and ultimately, if we ever need to do, roll them back together. And this declarative definition as a way of, of operating is really, really fantastic for rollbacks because I don't have to write any delete statements or revoke statements. If I rolled this back, all the pipeline would see is there is a timestamp, there is a column in this table called stored timestamp that shouldn't be there anymore because I've rolled my configuration back to a previous version and it will simply remove it for me. So by using this declarative approach to building Snowflake automatically, I'd never have to worry about what does a revert look like? What does a rollback look like? It's all handled completely automatically. So I've seen my environments. Um, I've seen how I can create a new feature branch, how I would iterate on that multiple times. Every time I ran that pipeline, it would update my environment. I get my stakeholders to look at it. And then I use my standard Git processes. I'd merge or merge requests into dev, and then into QA, and then ultimately into my master branch to build production. So build all of my environments from feature branch to production in a single click. If you want to build your knowledge more, our Datrops platform is available in Partner Connect. So sign up for a trial. If you go to datrops.live, there's a raft of information, our blogs, but also our recently published Datrops for Dummies book, which I'm co-author of. And finally, there is a philosophy site at truedatrops.org, which has been written by ourselves and people at Snowflake and a number of other industry pioneers, really to take a much more philosophical view on what should Datrops really be about. Not so much the technologies themselves, but what is it we're trying to achieve and how should we go about that? And if you've got any other questions, please don't hesitate to contact me at guy.adams at datrops.live. Thank you very much.